everyone, and I hope you've had a fantastic first day at the Sankalp Global Summit 2021. For those of you who I haven't yet had the pleasure to meet, my name is Aria Molino, and I'm joining today from Nairobi, Kenya. I hope you're having a great morning, day, or evening at Sankalp, wherever you are in the world. I know the transition to virtual is not an easy one for us, but it offers unparalleled opportunities for us to learn, share, and network. Our in-person summits were always biased by geographic factors. This week, we are convening thousands of people from across the global south. We have people joining us from Latin America and the Caribbean, Ecuador, Brazil, Mexico, and Barbados, from Europe, Germany, the Netherlands, France, and Kosovo, from Asia, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Indonesia, and Japan, from Africa, Togo, Cote d'Ivoire, Namibia, Malawi, and Madagascar, just to name a few. That's not including the folks from Australia, the Middle East, and North America who are also at Sankalp. We have over 50 countries participating, plus many, many more when we include, include those of you who are turning in on Facebook to watch these sessions live. The Sankalp community has grown over the last 13 years to tens of thousands of people globally. Individually, we are working on distinct and independent challenges, but collectively, we are working to create a better world for our children and for the next generation. We say that children are the future, but we often forget that there are still 150 million children who are child laborers globally. When we say inclusive, we need to actively include children in our work by evaluating our supply chains, our investments, and the direct indirect impact our actions have. We need to preserve and include our future generations. I would like to include our in, in, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening segment, who is doing just this. Mr. Kailash Satyarthi is an internationally acclaimed child rights activist who has tirelessly advocated for children's rights for four decades now. His interventions are spread across 140 countries in the world to protect children from slavery, trafficking, forced labor, sexual abuse, and all forms of violence. He has been instrumental in bringing the issues of children to global and national development agendas. He is also leading worldwide movements against child exploitation and upholding the rights of children for peace, safety, health, well-being, and education. His unrelenting efforts for restoring the rights of the most marginalized and exploited children in the world won him the Nobel Peace Prize in 2014. Here is a brief introduction to Mr. Satyarthi and his work. The Nobel Peace Prize for 2014 is to be awarded to Kailash Satyarthi for their struggle against suppression of young people and children. There is no greater violence than to deny the dreams of our children. I refuse to accept that the laws and constitutions are unable to protect our children. Today is the time for every child to have the right to life. I refuse to accept that the shackles of slavery can ever be more stronger than the quest for freedom, I refuse to accept here. Getting a greeting like this is all the reward Kailash Setyarti needs for freeing these children from a life of slavery. He tries to give these kids the childhood they missed. Do you think these kids see you as a Nobel Peace Prize winner? No, oh, I don't think they, they see me as friend or brother or something like father. I have looked into their frightened and exhausted eyes. I've held their injured bodies and I have felt their broken spirits. I refuse to accept that children belonging to certain sections of society are born to work for others at the cost of their childhood and freedom and education. If the children are exploited, if the children are deprived from their childhood in any part of the world, the world cannot live in peace. The world cannot be human. It's not often the two winners of the Nobel Peace Prize get together, but it happened yesterday when President Obama met Kailash Sartiarte. They were joined by three children who were rescued from child trafficking and forced marriage. 
you cannot live in isolation. All the problems and solutions are interconnected. And so the problem of child labor in any part of the world is your problem. Setyarti organizes raids with local police, but sometimes employers are tipped off and waiting for him armed. But I have been attacked many times in my life. You had a gun to your head? Literally, here. Yeah. This is dangerous work freeing these kids. Somebody has to pay the cost for freedom. It does not come on plate. So if I, if not me, then who else will do? Come on, Nobel Prize. Who won the Nobel Prize, he asks. In reply, all of us kids. It's good. <laughs>
healthcare, protection, and future. That's why sankalp, the resolve, is the key. This pandemic has exposed and exacerbated many injustices and inequalities in the society. But today, dear friends, I'm afraid to say that if we don't act with the resolve and urgency, if we don't feel some sense of, some sense of moral accountability and responsibility, then we will fail our children again and we will fail our future again. We have seen what has happened with Millennium Development Goals. Do you want to see the same fate of the Sustainable Development Goals? I'm sure no. Because Sustainable Development Goals are in danger. Not just because of pandemic, but because of so many other reasons. I will give you one example that in the first four years of SDG's announcement between 2016 and 2020, the number of child laborers has increased for the first time in two decades from 152 million to 160 million. There's no excuse, no justification for it. Because it has happened before pandemic. And the pandemic has brought even worse news that if we don't act, then 9 million additional children would be added to this vicious circle of poverty and exploitation, miseries. And if we are not able to take prompt measures to ensure social protection, then according to United Nations agencies, the bigger danger is that 46 million additional children may be pushed into child labor, slavery, trafficking, prostitution. We cannot allow this to happen, dear friends. Because SDGs have a beauty in it. It is a beautiful diffuse of development, human rights, and climate responsibility, climate justice. This was not the case in MDGs. We also understand that SDGs are standing on four pillars, people, planet, prosperity, and peace. They're all knitted together. That makes a chair you are sitting on. And that makes a cheer for the future of humankind. So we cannot afford to lose this. If we don't act now, then 24 million additional children will not be able to come back to school. There were already about 60 million children out of the schools, but 24 million children would be added to it. Why this is happening? Perhaps we have not brought the issues of children. Perhaps we have not given enough attention and justice to the most marginalized people in the world. As you know, that $8 trillion have been earmarked in the developed countries, industrialized world, as the COVID response fund. Is it not the shame that only 0.13% of it, 0.13%, not even half percent, were earmarked for the marginalized people, including children in the world? How can we think of an inclusive world? How can we think of the world without injustice, an equitable world. We have to think and act. But keep on blaming the government would not, solve, would not solve the problem. 
as I said, at the outset, that each one of us has a responsibility and each one of us has some power to act. I've read and heard about your previous uh, uh, actions and contributions in SDGs and also in the global development as Sankal. Therefore, I call upon you, dear friends, to double your effort, triple your efforts. Otherwise, we risk to lose the entire generation. Dear friends, we have come out with some ideas, some solutions. One is that we have done a calculation on behalf of uh, the group of Nobel laureates and global leaders and released that, uh, that calculation recently that only 52.9 billion dollars, 52.9 billion dollars can ensure social protection for every child and every pregnant woman in the low-income country, all the low-income countries, 52.9 billion dollars. And how much is that money? This is less than two days of COVID related expenditure, expenditure of G7 countries last year, just in one year, two days. And this is also less than 0.4% of social protection budgets or social protection spending in Europe. So it is not a big deal, dear friends. But we have to understand that when we talk of children, when we talk of child labor, denial of education, we have to think of a whole vicious circle. There's a triangular relationship between poverty, child labor, and illiteracy. Those children who are trapped into mines and factories, workplaces, farms and fields, they are not just 160 million children as child laborers. They are 160 million jobs of adults taken by children because every single child is working at the cost of one adult's job. These are 160 million empty seats in the classrooms because these children are not in classrooms, they are in workplaces. There are also 160 million missing climate actions. And therefore, the United Nations University itself has come out with a report recently that 60% of the indicators of success related to SDGs depend on the success of children's related goals. If we keep on allowing child labor, then we will keep on allowing adults. Unemployment means poverty. It is a myth that poverty causes and perpetuates child labor. Child labor also causes intergenerational poverty and discrimination and injustices and inequality. Intergenerational poverty. So we have to act now. And this is possible, dear sisters and brothers. I can tell you just in a minute that when I started this fight against child labor in India and then South Asia and globally 40 years ago, it was a known issue. But I was quite clear that we cannot end the miseries and exploitation of children without ending child labor. Today, I'm proud to say that millions of people in governments, in businesses, in civil society and faiths, they are the part of this movement, not only with me or my organization, but also with many other organizations which have been uh, evolved during the time. 
We organized a global march against child labor in 1998 with the demand that there should be an international law against worst forms of child labor that has resulted in ILO convention. And since then, the number of child laborers has decreased from year 2000 to 2016 from 250 million to 150 million approximately. 100 million lesser number of children were engaged in child labor during those 15, 16 years. We can make it. We did it in the past. We have seen that how the number of out of school children has reduced from 130 million in 2000 to 60 million in 2016. So it is possible. It is also possible because the people like you, not only with good heart, but also with compassionate leadership, with compassionate intelligence that is also reflected in your businesses in some cases that is much more needed today to ensure that no child labor is involved in any supply chain, in any production, anywhere in the world. So dear friends, this is not only possible, but it is achievable, it is attainable to end child labor, to end illiteracy of children. But as I said, that we have to act with utmost resolve and a deepest sense of urgency. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Satyati. We would now like to show a video uh, of one of your uh, children you've worked with. My name is Triti Kumar. I am a Nepal Nitra Gram Devdur. I am a member of the Foundation of the Nepal Panchayati. I worked in Abra's work, but I am studying in today's class. And I have completed my work and made a good teacher in my life. Because I want to make a good teacher in my life. I want to make a good teacher in my life. I want to make a good teacher in my life. I want to make a good teacher in my life. I want to make a good teacher in my life. Because I want to make a good teacher in my life. पढ़ाई से वंचित होकर जंगलों में जाकर अब्र के खदानों में मजदूरी किया करते थे लेकिन साल 2016 में हमारे गांव को एक बाल हमारे गांव को एक बाल मित्र ग्राम के रूप में चुना गया जिसमें सत्यार्थी फाउंडेशन के भैया सब आकर हम सभी हम सभी को मीटिंग में बैठाकर कर समझाए समझाया करते थे कि हम सभी बच्चों को इस उम्र में बाल मजदूरी नहीं बल्कि पढ़ाई करनी चाहिए हमें उनकी बातों को सुनना बहुत अच्छा लगता था लेकिन फिर भी हम उनकी बातों को नहीं मानते थे और बार बार हम बाल मजदूरी करने के लिए चले जाते थे फिर भी वो हमें बार बार समझाते थे और लास्ट में वो हमें किन्हीं तरह से समझा बुझाकर हम सभी बच्चों का नामांकन स्कूल में करवाए फिर हमारे गांव में एक बाल पंचायत का गठन करवाया गया जिसमे ग्यारह बाल मजदूर करने वाले बच्चों को चिन्हित किया गया और उन्हें एक सप्ताह का टाइम प्रचार प्रसार करने के लिए दिया गया फिर जाकर हमारे गाँव में बाल पंचायत का गठन हुआ तब हमारे ग्राम पंचायत के मुखिया ने हमारे बाल पंचायत को मान्यता दी और हम सभी बाल पंचायत के बच्चे मिलकर अपने गांव में हर महीने एक बैठक करते हैं जिसमें बच्चों की परेशानियों को समझते हुए उन पर उनका हम संविधान करते हैं जैसे बाल मजदूरी बाल विवाह इस सभी परेशानियों को हम मिलकर हम सभी बच्चे मिलकर उनका संविधान करते हैं और मैं बताना चाहती हूँ कि लॉकडाउन लगने के कारण हमारे गाँव के कुछ ऐसे बच्चे थे जो फिर से अपनी पढ़ाई लिखाई छोड़कर अब तक के खदानों में मजदूरी करने के लिए जाने लगे थे लेकिन जैसे ही हम बाल पंचायत बच्चों को इन बातों का पता चला फिर हम सभी बाल पंचायत ने मिलकर अपने गांव में घर घर जाकर दरवाजा खटखटा अभियान के तहत तो उन सभी बच्चों को चिन्हित किए जो फिर से अपनी पढ़ाई लिखाई छोड़कर अब तक के खदानों में मजदूरी करने के लिए जाने लगे थे इन, इन सभी चीजों को करते हुए हम अपने गाँव में कुल 25 बच्चों को चिन्हित किए हैं जो फिर से मजदूरी करने के लिए जाने लगे थे और जैसे ही लॉकडाउन के बाद स्कूल खिला खुला हम उन बच्चों का नामांकन स्कूल में करवाएं जिससे वो अपनी पढ़ाई पूरी कर सके और मैं बतानी सा, बताना चाहती हूँ कि लॉकडाउन में हमारे गांव में एक एक हमारी सहेली रहती थी जिनके माता पिता बेहद ही गरीब थे और वो मजदूरी किया करते थे लेकिन लॉकडाउन में ये मजदूरी वगैरह बंद हो जाने के कारण वो अपने सेट से कुछ पैसे उधार लिए थे और टाइम पर वो पैसे वापस नहीं कर सके इसके लिए वो सेट उनके घर आकर उनपे दबाव डालने लगा कि 
कि अगर आप हम, आप हमारी पैसे वापस नहीं करते तो आप अपनी बेटी की शादी हमसे करवा दीजिए अगर आप ऐसा नहीं करेंगे तो हम आपकी बेटी को जबरदस्ती उठाकर ले जाएंगे जैसे ही इस बातों को पता हम बात पंचायत के बच्चों को चला वैसे हम तुरंत अपने कार्यकर्ता भैया सबको बताए और भैया सब आकर हमारे गांव में एक बहुत बड़ी मीटिंग करवाई गई जिसमें उनके पेरेंट्स और उन सेठ को बुलाया गया और सभी के सब सभी के सहमति के साथ उस मीटिंग में तय किया गया कि आप इस लड़की से शादी नहीं कर सकते क्योंकि इनकी शादी करने की उम्र नहीं हुई है इनकी उम्र बस चौदह साल है और आप पैंतीस वर्ष के हैं इसलिए आप इनसे शादी नहीं कर सकते उस मीटिंग में उनको सभी के सामने माफी दिलवाई गई और उनसे लिखित रूप में लिया गया कि आप इनसे शादी नहीं करेंगे और आज हम बार पंचायत के बच्चे बहुत ही खुश हैं क्योंकि हमारे गांव में बार पंचायत का गठन होने के कारण अबरक अनुकूल्य होते हैं जो हम अबरक चुनने के लिए जब अबरक के खदानों में जाते हैं तो हम बच्चों का हाथ नर्म होता है जिसके कारण कई बार हमारे हाथ पट जाते थे और कई बार ऐसे मायका माए से धस जाने के कारण कई बच्चों की मृत्यु भी हो जाती थी और लेकिन जब से हमारे गांव में बाल पंचायत का गठन हुआ है तब से हमारे गांव में ना कोई बच्चा बाल मजदूर करता है ना किसी बच्चे की बाल विवाह होती है और हम इसलिए खुश हैं क्योंकि हम आज ये बाल विवाह बाल मजदूरी और किसी बच्चे के प्रति होने वाले शोषण से आजाद है Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Satyati, for your inspiring work and for passionately encouraging us all to increase our personal and collective resolve. Indeed, each of us can do more to end child labor and ensure those 160 million children are in school instead of factories, mines, or worse. I will now invite Thomasine Ford, BBC presenter, journalist, and filmmaker, to lead us through a discussion with Mr. Satyati and the subsequent panel discussion. Welcome, Tamasin. Thank you, Ariel, and a big thank you again to you, Mr. Satyati. I want to pick up on something that we just heard there from 13-year-old Priti Kumari, that 25 children just in her village alone went back to work during the pandemic. Unfortunately, because of that children's council that your foundation helped set up, she they got them back out of work, but we know this is not the case for millions of children around the world. How worried are you that COVID has impacted the gains the world has made in stamping out child labour? Well, as I mentioned before that uh, at least 9 million children are being pushed into child labour during the pandemic towards the end of 2020, uh, 2022. So uh, it's serious, but also there is another data that if we don't act and don't provide them social protection, then the number would be additionally 46 million. So it will cross 200 million towards the end of uh, 2022. So this is quite alarming. I will give you one example that we, my organization, uh, Bachpan Bachao Andolan or Save the Childhood Movement, has physically rescued over 9,500 children from trafficking and slavery. Most of them were being trafficked during the pandemic time and last six, uh, 18, 18 months or so. So it's very obvious, very clear that uh, child labor and trafficking is at increase. Not only in India, but I receive, we work across uh, the world and we receive similar reports from, from most countries developing countries. So this is the situation. But we have tried to, uh, to uh, challenge, uh, challenge it uh, in those villages where Preeti comes from. Uh, these villages are called child-friendly villages. A child-friendly village is a village where we are able to stop child labor, child trafficking, child marriages, child sexual abuse, and other kind of exploitation of children, especially girls. Secondly, all children must be in schools, in classrooms. Thirdly, they form their children's parliament or children's assembly, elected assembly, uh, as Preeti was mentioning. And the fourth thing is that the official village parliament, which has power, which has money, decisive power, uh, an official body, 
uh, they recognizes uh, recognize the uh, the children's parliament so this youth or children's assembly as well as the adult assembly work hand in hand to solve the children's related problem in the villages and this is also a very practical realization of sustainable development goals on the ground we can talk of sdgs but when it comes to all issues made with the people's related issues uh, uh, other uh, climate related issues ecology related issues or uh, harmony and peace related issues gender equality and justice and everything that is uh, that is the melting pot uh, this child friendly village and we are working across more than 650 uh, child friendly villages in india but also in over 100 villages in nepal and some villages in africa as well and this is a model where we are not investing too much but we are trying to inculcate um, the values of democracy you know partnership cooperation uh, leadership among the young people uh, gender justice etc so that is working and this is helping in diverting the official resources, the state resources in favor of children. And in this case, in almost all villages, there was no trafficking from those villages due to the efforts of child-friendly village model. Unfortunately, we're running over time for this session, but I do have one more question for you, Mrs. Satyati. If you could give one piece of advice to businesses, funding organizations, when it comes to child labor and this post-pandemic recovery, what would it be? Well, first of all, they should feel that we cannot accomplish most of the sustainable development goals without ending this scourge of child slavery, trafficking, illiteracy, denial of education, health, et cetera, et cetera. So how to bring the issues of children in center left and right, front and back. So child-centric thinking. Uh, secondly, um, if uh, some entrepreneurs um, are having their uh, industries and companies, they should make sure that no child labor is involved in their supply chain in any manner in production. Thirdly, as consumers, they can raise the voice, but also they can join some of the uh, civil society organizations, some uh, groups which are trying to uh, address this, um, this uh, serious uh, danger looming on the entire generation. So for example, we ourselves um, is spearheading several campaigns and one of them is justice for every child and justice for every child is to make sure that the children who are affected by trafficking slavery prostitution but more importantly uh, child sexual abuses they should be given justice they should get justice in time they should given they should be given uh, mental health support the girls who are uh, raped or who are uh, abused or boys as well um, in some states in India they will never get justice in next 20 years or even 30 years and that would be mockery on justice so therefore we are having this campaign in uh, 50 districts to begin with and then we are going to increase it to make sure that there should be free legal aid support free mental health support to make sure that the government programs we are working closely with the government agencies to ensure that the justice is delivered in time so there are so many things happening around the world but rehabilitation of these children education of these children we have this uh, rehabilitation program of balashram where we are trying to inculcate the leadership among those who have been undergone through slavery and trafficking. So many other organizations are doing, but please, for the sake of SDGs uh, success, it is important that we should prioritize the issues of children in the SDGs and that uh, they can do, they can easily find some solutions and then be the partner take the ownership, take the leadership. It is not just you give the money, it is more than that. You have to speak out loudly. You have, you are not just the money-making machines. The, the enterprises are not the money-minting machines. They are also change makers. 
these people who are listening to me are the change makers whatever good or bad they do whatever they do consciously or unconsciously intentionally or unintentionally it is going to affect the future of humankind and i am sure that the people sitting here have that much of compassion and compassionate intelligence to act and finally i would just say that uh, a, a, a story um, when i was um, uh, invited to give my acceptance speech after the nobel prize ceremony in norway some years ago then i lost my speaking notes my papers and suddenly a story came to my mind and you can imagine that if a laureate has lost his paper or her paper it never happened in their history but it happened with me luckily so i remembered a story which i read in childhood that there was a heavy fire broken out in jungle all animals including king lion were rushing uh, leaving the jungle uh, as soon as possible and lion suddenly noticed that a tiny hummingbird is flying towards the fire so he was surprised and shouted that what are you doing this bird replied sir i was born and grew up in this jungle i am not going to leave it like that i am going to extinguish this fire he was more surprised and what how what are you talking about and she said sir look at my beak i am carrying a drop of water i am going to do my bit i am doing my bit dear friends you have more power than you have in world you can do your bit to save this place where you were born and grew up this is our moral responsibility these children are not going to knock on your door but they need you dear friends and i invite you to join me to join this fight against child labor thank you so much poignant and to think about we all must play our bit mr kailash satyarthi nobel peace laureate thank you so much for joining us and a big welcome to the rest of you to the opening plenary session the title of this session is mainstreaming impact a global pathway to an inclusive green recovery um, just to note, we would love to include audience members in this um, and hear your questions at the end. So please type them into the, the Q&A and we'll try and get a few of them uh, on at the end. Now, we have a great cast to talk about this topic. Let me introduce you. Uh, first off, Priti Sina, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Capital Development Fund. Welcome. Axel Adi, former Liberia Commerce Minister and now founder of EcoCap Investment Group, uh, linking investment opportunities in emerging markets. Axel, thanks for joining us. And Veena Reddy, the Mission Director for USAID in India. Veena, great to have you on. Right. Before we talk about the post-pandemic recovery in the Global South and what's essential for making that happen, I wanted to touch on this idea of the new poor. The number of people living in extreme poverty has risen for the first time in more than 20 years. The World Bank estimates it could be as many as an additional 150 million people. Veena, starting with you then, one of the tragic things about this is that it includes people who had risen out of poverty pre-COVID, but then as the pandemic struck, it pushed them back into poverty. Give us an idea of what this looks like on the ground in India. Great, thank you. Uh, and thank you for uh, the introduction and uh, for inviting me uh, to participate here. I'm very grateful to Sankalp. Uh, uh, so yes, uh, the pandemic has had a worldwide effect, uh, but it has hurt marginalized communities more than anyone else, uh, people who are already marginalized. Uh, and I think in India, for example, we'll see that uh, I think during the lockdown, the initial lockdown, even before wave two, about 120 million people lost their livelihoods. But the majority of that was people in um, uh, informal, the informal sector. 
And so those are the more uh, vulnerable. And it also affects uh, women disproportionately, as we've seen all disasters, all pandemics uh, have a, a, a disproportionate effect, a negative effect. And uh, so we've seen it, uh, but I think we all have opportunities to learn from history. And we, you know, I think all the, the panelists here, as well as uh, the, the, the folks uh, listening in here, uh, know that we, we could be a force of change. Um, I was uh, privileged to meet with uh, several uh, small scale women entrepreneurs last week. Uh, and they uh, all had suffered from, you know, the effects of COVID, uh, but uh, the, both the physical and the economic effects. And uh, one thing that struck me is that through uh, a program that we run for uh, empowering them as, as entrepreneurs through an economic lens, uh, they gained self-confidence. And uh, in fact, one of the women said that she, um, uh, before, uh, you know, what wasn't really encouraged to go out of the community, et cetera. And, but then as a result of her changing her livelihood, changing her, having more confidence, uh, now she's seen as a leader in her community uh, and uh, she is being called upon to mediate disputes, uh, to do other things that are, you know, not, not just in the economic realm. And I think that brings home one of the points that, uh, uh, Mr. Kailash brought that everything is inter interconnected. Uh, and she, uh, through that confidence, uh, is able to benefit her community. And so the, I think recognizing that this marginalization uh, isn't just a problem for that community, that it's a problem for all of us uh, is important uh, to recognize. Thank you. Let's bring in some of the other panelists then. Axel, how do small business owners and entrepreneurs fit into this new pool? The people pre-COVID who had started on their journey of running their own business? Well, a lot of small businesses uh, uh, were devastated. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation and thanks to Sankalp uh, for the invitation. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel. Yes, uh, you know, many countries across Africa uh, are dominated by SMEs. Uh, they account for over 60% of the business activities in many of these countries, and they all operate uh, in the informal sector. And so uh, the COVID disruption, uh, the lockdowns, uh, you know, the restriction in the movement of uh, global uh, supply chains, getting uh, supplies into these economies has completely devastated a lot of these, uh, you know, very small mom and pop uh, operators with very small margins. If you think about it, the women who trade across borders, you know, who, who transact across border all across the continent, uh, lost those economic opportunities to trade. Uh, and so um, it's, it's, it's a huge devastation uh, across, uh, you know, a population that's, uh, that's thriving and innovating. I mean, you, you meet so many young people that are doing so many amazing things uh, to, again, bring new innovation, to tap into that uh, uh, group of, 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 you know, SME that are operating in, whether it's in agriculture or in uh, various services. And you think about the day laborers who, you know, from your cleaners uh, to, the waste collector, uh, uh, you know, community waste collectors to all these people completely were out of out of work. So, uh, and, and there is no sort of stimulus or social protection, to, you know, to provide some sort of support uh, to get back, to, to have them get back on their feet. And so they, they've been devastated. And I think uh, what governments are looking for is the opportunity to negotiate with their uh, bankers for some debt relief that will, will you know, free up some uh, uh, funds so that they can address some of these challenges. Quick uh, shout out to Grace Baba from Liberia, one of your uh, fellow country people. She's uh, put a little message on our Q&A. Welcome, Grace. Um, Prithi, to, to you then, the, the UN now says COVID could lead to a lost decade for development. And to add to this, it says the post-pandemic recovery is increasing the divide between the haves and have-nots. 
as Mr. Uh, Satyati spoke about the, the stimulus money for the post-pandemic recovery, uh, the UN's Financing for Sustainable Development report, published just in March, stated 16 trillion US dollars in stimulus and recovery funds that were made available globally, yet less than 20% was spent in developing countries. How is this unequal distribution of funds contributing to this new pool? Thank you, Thomasine, and to the other panelists. So let me start with the word resolve. So just to bring in uh, uh, Kailash Satyarthi's resolve into this panel. So just a word on uh, what the UN member states did uh, back in 66 to create us. So I don't think many of you may know what we do. So the UN Capital Development Fund was set up by a resolution as well of the member states to finance the 46 least developed countries. And I say that because that's our uh, sort of uh, I'm gambit, and that's where all the countries with per capita income of less than $1,000 uh, a year. So just for us, we, we actually, our delivery went up. We did more work in the COVID uh, time, unfortunately, uh, while you know, there was lockdown, et cetera. And to refer to Axel, we actually also financed the SMEs, and I'd like to come to an example of how we helped one uh, survive the COVID period. But to your broader question on the global economy of uh, you know, the COVID recovery, obviously, you know, the IMF World Bank meetings are on. So the SDR discussion allocation of up to 15 to 20% of the developed countries SDRs to the least developed countries is under discussion. The IDA replenishment is currently on as well. So there are those global macroeconomic discussions going on. The G20 will look at it seriously. But uh, our role at the UN Capital Development Fund is to be the voice of our uh, 46 LDCs. So for example, during the UN General Assembly, we created a session called the Sovereign Borrowers Conference, where we wanted to strengthen uh, the capacity of these countries to think about ratings that put them on the path to global capital markets. Then we want to work with them as to do innovations to reduce the cost of borrowing. So we don't want to burden them with more debt, uh, but to find ways such as nature performance bonds or you know, new mechanisms as you know, COP is coming up. What would be some climate mitigation aspects that these uh, countries could adopt that would eventually bring down the interest to their sovereign loans so almost to zero if they adopted those. So those are some uh, global capital market uh, initiatives. But I did want to put in this word about a company called Safe Boda in uh, Uganda that we help fund. So what UNCDF does is we really finance in the last miles. So we are a hybrid development agency, development finance agency. So we first give the grant to somebody like a Safe Boda to develop the business plan. It's a motorcycle a taxi company, the Uber, the motorcycle Uber of Uganda. Uh, and of course, during uh, COVID, uh, you know, the business shut down. So we help them pivot um, to becoming a grocery delivery company. And this is our digital work. So we have a stream on digital, digital work, one on municipal work, and one on investment uh, work. So where we do loans and guarantees as well. So to save Boda, we help them pivot to become a grocery supply company. And now they are you know, doing it, they're thriving. And I believe uh, global uh, Uber type of companies are interested in um, seeing where this uh, company goes next. So those are some examples starting from the macro, helping these countries um, hold their destinies in their own hands. And then um, some of the SME work that we hope we can uh, help with and facilitate and finance. Thanks. We know that women have been adversely affected by the economic crisis brought about by COVID. And, and Vina, you mentioned women bear the brunt of all crises, um, natural disasters, um, whatever. They're the people that suffer the most. How then, Vina, do we bring them to the forefront of the recovery? Thank you. Uh well, I think that we needs to be intentional uh, to target uh, those communities that are marginalized. Uh, and so, you know, in several, uh, you know, we, we think that development, uh, that the gender and women's issues are not just at the, a part of development, but at the very core, uh, that if this portion of our population uh, doesn't enjoy its full rights and uh, full responsibilities uh, that society as a whole will not prosper. So uh, I guess to, as to the question is how do we bring it to the forefront, uh, you know, at, at least at USAID, it's uh, for every time that we 
enter into a project uh, or design anything new, uh, we have a gender analysis done uh, and, and also recognizing that gender is a spectrum. Uh, and we look at uh, how will this particular intervention uh, either benefit or, or have any impact on gender. Uh, so it could be something as simple as if you're you know, designing a port or something, uh, you know, where the bathrooms are, or what the lighting is, that, that all, you know, the, this, the women's safety uh, is uh, just one example um, of, of this kind of intentional design and in everything we do. Uh, and and, and at, uh, here in India, we have, uh, as part of the economic recovery of COVID, uh, we do put a lot of emphasis on women and uh, helping them recover. And also uh, all these diseases that have, uh, you know, other health needs that have been neglected dur during COVID as well. Uh, and we look at uh, issues uh, like how to best address transgender women's needs as well uh, to try to be as inclusive as possible. So the idea is in intentional funding is crucial at the moment. The thing is that we know female entrepreneurs, for example, the world over get less VC funding than their male counterparts. Take out the pandemic. Before the pandemic, they were getting less than 3% globally. Axel, focusing specifically on Africa, which has the highest rate of female entrepreneurs in the world, yet the latest statistics show that less than 1%, it's in fact 0.7% of funding raised by startups in Africa so far this year went to all female founded teams, less than 1%. What needs to change? It's more than just intentional funding, isn't it? Well, I mean, government policy needs to change. Uh, it needs to be directed. Uh, you know, I often say when an investor is going into our country, uh, you need to look at the government policy, the government branding, and most importantly, the government investment. On the government side, the government needs to take those considerations uh, if you want to direct investment in a particular area, in a particular sector, for a particular agenda. Uh, when uh, I was in government, we uh, was able to pass a law called the Small Business Empowerment Act. And the idea is to find a way to incentivize the transition of SMEs from the informal sector to the formal sector by creating opportunities through government public procurement. Now, during the stakeholder consultations, many uh, entrepreneurs felt that uh, in order to do this, the government had to create a special set aside uh, for SMEs. And women advocated that why is a special set aside for SME? There should be a specific set aside. And in the law, there should be a specific clause about a set aside for women. And that concluded with the 25% set aside with 20% uh, for SMEs with a specific 5% for uh, women entrepreneurs. Um, the first implementation of the law, we saw that uh, government was giving contract to SMEs to the tune of $80 million. And women entrepreneurs were getting all the various contracts uh, related to events, planning, and services. And even within my ministry, I made it a requirement that all events coordination, when we had the large international trade fairs, uh, uh, were organized and, and carried out by women entrepreneurs. Over the years, we began to see more and more women entrepreneurs participate in the trade fair. So government policy has to be directed, it has to be intentional, and investors are going to take their signal from the government policy. So if you think about it, uh, the government will go around and we have stakeholders, and this is where uh, you know, uh, organizations like UNCDF can provide that technical support to help the government develop policies that are intentional, that, uh, that take into consideration the SDGs. But once those policies are done, the government also has to brand it and market it to uh, the global uh, community that the government is ready for investment, is directing investment in women, you know, in the, in the direction of uh, women entrepreneurs, is particularly looking at green technology and green innovation. Okay? And then the government has to go out and sell the idea the same way that a private company would go out and sell a new idea. But to even guarantee and assure investors that the government is uh, committed to the process, the government has to invest itself. 
So with us, with the SBA law and the creation of the Small Business Administration, we the government did not have the fiscal space to invest directly. So we provided the incentive. We use government procurement, government budget to create allocation for SMEs. And I think that's one way you can tackle some of these uh, challenges. So as well as intentional funding, government policies also need to change. Pretty, the UN Capital Development Fund, as you said, is, is all about making public and private finance work for the least developed countries. How then are you ensuring investment is making its way to female-led businesses and entrepreneurs? Absolutely, Tamansin. I would echo very much what Excel said, and that's what some of the work we've done. Uh, so what we try to do is uh, work with governments on technical assistance to bring in some of this uh, women uh, financing elements, especially, uh, let's say, in the case of mobile money. So some uh, financial inclusion policies that first enable mobile money to be used by small businesses, and then within that, uh, the aspect of uh, women's inclusion. So just one example, um, not of policy, but of a project we did in Papua New Guinea. So there's a very nice bank called Mama Bank, uh, uh, and it caters, uh, you know, it wants to cater to women. We found that uh, there was literacy rate was low in Papua New Guinea, so we introduced biometric um, uh, sort of uh, assigning for the women to access the accounts. And then we gave a further loan of just 250,000 to Mama Bank to allow that to go to women uh, um, microfinance activities. So working both with the governments on policy inclusion, the public side, and then with the kind of private investment into the uh, actual entities, the banks, financial institutions, the SMEs, to create a more enabling environment for women. And uh, as panelists said, we try to enable uh, this focus on women throughout our activities during COVID, uh, we, you know, we did special loans to SMEs um, to make sure that they continued businesses of which 60% was you know, for the women uh, SMEs and that trying to keep uh, sure that they kept going. And we have some great examples, a very uh, articulate, forward-looking women, Kombeza food uh, is one such example, uh, on dairy and so on. So across the field, and uh, we're working currently also with a partner called IIX that you may be familiar with uh, out of Singapore. Uh, they did the women's livelihood bonds. So the idea I've always been fascinated and I'd like UNCDF to do more of this is mobilizing institutional money into the SMEs. So what happens is you float a bond, a public bond on a, a stock exchange, uh, which they did uh, IIX in um, Singapore, and then you funnel that money into women SMEs. So that's the kind of activities we'd like to do. And uh, we're looking at a concept called orange bonds because orange is the color of SDG five. And we'll be coming back to you with more information on how that would help um, create the policy and also the issuance of more orange bonds as a next wave to the green bonds. Thank you, Priti. That's yeah, it's really fascinating. The innovation that's coming out of this. I want to pick up um, a question from uh, one of our listeners, Dilshad. I'm not sure where you're from, Dilshad, but it's a really interesting point. Um, mentioned about women reporting that they spend their grants, which they receive for their businesses, directly on the business uh, in comparison to men. Veena, do you think grant support or even lending for business, this is the question from Dilshad, uh, lending for business revival can be more gender targeted to improve efficiency? Uh, yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, I would add that uh, looking at what is inhibiting more women from participating is a good idea. And, um, you know, what a lot of what we try to do is try to encourage uh, private sector businesses uh, to uh, take on uh, what they may perceive as riskier investments. And a lot of those might be for women, right? Uh, that, will, you know, can we make a loan? Uh, to some, maybe a woman who has no collateral or doesn't have the credit history. But uh, if we um, can kind of guarantee some part of that uh, loan, then we can show, and, and the women are then repaying, uh, we show that, uh, that this is a credit worthy uh, segment of the population or, or, or you know, it could be a sector and it may, it may not be a person, but uh, like what sector that you're working in or, and, and so encourage these uh, commercial organizations uh, to invest somewhere where maybe they wouldn't have, but that once they have a little bit of de-risking uh, through uh, US government support, uh, they'll see that this is uh, an area that they should continue their investments in and 
for COVID-19 alone, we have uh, over $200 million of guarantees uh, for economic response uh, with a focus on women, for example. Uh, so, and, and all of this is in areas where we're trying to encourage uh, the private sector to take on um, an area of financing that perhaps they wouldn't otherwise. The pandemic has disrupted global activity across the globe. We know that, but it's also shone a light on the explicit link between trade and health with the virus spreading along trade and travel routes around the globe and the poorest community suffering the most. Axel, while trade in many senses help to spread COVID, what role should it now play in the recovery? Well, I, I think world, uh, I think the new director general is leading the cause for vaccine equity, um, but it has changed the position of what the, the WTO uh, could stand for in for today's reality. You know, for the most part, um, trade expertise have focused on you know improving global supply chains, um, but. Uh, there is a clear uh, correlation between the efficiency of global trade supply chains uh, and the movement when it comes to emergency response. We saw that during Ebola, and now we see it uh, during COVID. And so I think you will see more of a greater cooperation between the, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, and the other development organizations, because trade does play a pivotal role. But that advocacy, again, when it comes to vaccine uh, access, particularly for least developed countries, um, is key. As you know, in the beginning, it became a, you know, every, everybody for themselves. You know, countries became very uh, much concerned about, and which is natural. You know, there's an old saying, you know, of all God's children, we love ourselves the best. Uh, <laughs> so countries immediately went to protect their own uh, their own populations. But what uh, global trade has shown is that, you know, we are a global village and, and no matter how much you think you can, uh, you know, create your own isolated bubble, we are interconnected in so many ways. Uh, now you see the price of commodities have increased for so many products because the supply chains have been, uh, the supply chains have been disrupted uh, by the pandemic. And so I think it's, it's showcased that in as much as it can be a, a route for a, 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 some of huge massive disruption, it can also be the, the route for innovation that will to, to, to end the, uh, the uh, pandemic. And, is, and that's the push for more global cooperation. And so I think uh, the work the WTO is now focused on, you know, uh, as the pri priority is to work with the WHO and, uh, and the World Bank and other key players, the IMF, to see how best that the trade actors, when it comes to uh, intellectual property rights and the release of, 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 of rights uh, for production on, on the African continent, for example, and any other least developed countries, um, is critical to having a global response. Because, you know, yes, we may have 80% vaccinated in developed countries, but those countries will remain vulnerable for as long as COVID uh, exists. And so I think trade now is playing a more pivotal role. And this is one thing I've always advocated in, in most de uh, least developed countries. Um, trade is looked at uh, sort of as an afterthought, but it is always very much a part of uh, the pulse and the lifeblood of any country's transformation. And I often tell people when you go into a country, go and visit the, the Ministry of Economy or the Ministry of Trade, and that tells you where the priorities sit. And back to that thing of government prioritizing instead of, uh, of, of prioritizing, oftentimes the priority is given to how do we acquire uh, debt to finance our major infrastructure, uh, but trade can do a lot of that. Uh, and, you, and countries in Asia tend to do a better job at it in terms of forming the right kind of PPPs, in, in terms of looking at new financial, uh, innovative financial instrument to finance their, their, their growth and development. And so, I think trade um, that, and, and I think this is some of the work that UNCDF is doing is sort of, you know, looking at creative ways to get government to move more away from uh, aid and aid and, and debt to, to move towards uh, trade and innovation and, and, and innovative financing to finance the development agenda and then drive inclusion. 
So we're talking about inclusion, but we're also talking about a pandemic recovery, which is green. Priti, how do you make public and private finance work in a green recovery? And what does a climate smart pandemic recovery look like? Thanks, Amasin. So one of the things we do, I mentioned, is municipal financing. We are one of the very few agencies in the world that focuses on the sub-national level. So most of the MDBs, as you know, focus on the sovereign level. So at the municipal level, we work with governments <clears throat> to get them direct funding from the Green Climate Fund, for example. So we have a program called LOCAL, which uh, stands for Local Climate Adaptive Living Facility. Um, we give performance-based grants to the government. So we give the grant, but we ask them to do certain climate adaptation activities, inform them, train them, and then help them get access to the greater climate funds. So in this way, we've mobilized $100 million for some of our LDC partners, uh, countries, and what's great is um, around 27 of them are on a board, and that we're taking that to COP as one of our key flagship initiatives to highlight the fact that some of the green funding and climate adaptation should go to the least of the developed countries so that we can build new better. You know, here we are building new bus terminals, building new, um, you know, shipping yards, et cetera. Let's do it in a better way. We have a chance to do it in a more green recovery. So that's uh, that would be one example I would uh, say that uh, we're doing. Uh, another one, just uh, talking a little bit about trade. I, I feel that, um, you know, entrepreneurs and regional businesses are also part of that trade discussion. So one of our funds, uh, just to sort of try to tell you a little bit about ourselves as well while we go along, is a, is a blended fund called BUILD um, with Bamboo Capital Partners uh, Impact Fund. So we funded a company called Mavezi. Mavezi is a, a solar distribution company out in Kenya. And they then distribute those products into Uganda, Tanzania, and the neighboring markets. So trying to pick such winners uh, that can be regional leaders uh, in terms of entrepreneurial models and have trade across the countries. Um, I, you know, I worked for six years for the African Development Bank as well. So regional trade, uh, I mean, just cross um, country flows uh, is really important. Um, and then just to touch that the role of guarantees, which Rina talked about, is also very important. So we, we go ahead and put, uh, try to put a lot of guarantees in. And one of them, uh, for example, on the green recovery, again, is in Gambia a solar power plant of 10 megawatts. We did a $9 million guarantee on that. And that's brought in $15 million of private capital into that project. So as far as, as long as the guarantee is there, I think that really attracts private capital. So there's been a long discussion continues on the role of public capital to do the de-risking for private capital to come in. Veena, we know that COVID has exacerbated the climate crisis people are disproportionately experiencing in the, the least development countries. Can you give us an idea of what that looks like on the ground in India? Oh, thank you, yeah. Uh, well, definitely we see uh, increased risk uh, here, uh, or, you know, the, uh, with the, uh, sorry, the, uh, of climate change and, for this uh, U.S. administration, this is a quite a high priority uh, to address uh, climate change and to, uh, you know, as, as I think as you said, build back better, build back greener, uh, and uh, as we talked about some of the uh, the guarantees that uh, we uh, do, the loan guarantees are around the area of green energy, uh, of uh, renewable energy. Uh, we also are looking at uh, ways to help India meet its commitment uh, to, uh, I, I believe it's 450 gigawatts uh, of renewable energy, as well as the US government itself uh, commit making these commitments. So we look at innovative ways of financing this uh, to try to rebuild uh, in a green, uh, and it, like, to, to encourage a more green economy, uh, but it also, you know, uh, it's, uh, I think we should also look at uh, preparing for the next disaster. Uh, and so that is another area that we think that India can really uh, take a leadership role in the region and in the world. Uh, and uh, we were supporting the uh, Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure as a way of sharing these technologies, uh, sharing uh, these, uh, the innovations here. Uh, and throughout the world. Uh, so we're really 
proud to, to be part of uh, the fight against climate change uh, and to uh, help the world build back better. Thanks. Axel, we've already touched on the importance of trade in this pandemic recovery, but how do you, how, do, how can trade policies align with climate goals in this green recovery? Well, uh, you know, a lot of governments are sort of going through the learning process of how to, to use uh, climate finance funds uh, as a means of financing uh, uh, green recovery. Again, it goes back to technical assistance. I, I think um, in Liberia, for example, you know, this idea of carbon credit, um, having people with the capacity on the ground that's able to provide the kind of uh, support uh, to access facilities around uh, carbon credit, the, the whole under the whole building the capacity to understand what that means for a country like Liberia, and you see entrepreneurs that are that are doing different things in the economy, but it starts. With, I, I go back I, as a public figure. Uh, I go back to government policies will will either stimulate momentum in a certain direction or not, and 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 so when it comes to uh, the green recovery in terms of the kind of funding uh, that is directed, at, let's say agriculture, for example, um, that is directed in terms of energy to tackle uh, energy access, particularly in rural areas. All of this can be stimulated by government policies. You know, government waive uh, duties and fees on on inputs for agriculture. Uh, we're able to do that. A government waiver for solar panels and 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 and, uh, and supplies and equipment. Uh, that's a way government can contribute uh, to this uh, process. Uh, government providing guarantees to banks that is that are lending to entrepreneurs is going to also attract other entrepreneurs. Uh, to come in, uh, some friends and I uh, co-founded something called Marula Square, and, and the part of that is to identify entrepreneurs that are doing innovations uh, around the sustainable development goals. And now we have a cohort that has put that is putting together a fund to fund those entrepre entrepreneurs at a very early stage because there is a struggle to identify entrepreneurs, and there is a struggle to, to, to identify entrepreneurs that are ready for investment. And so one of the things that Marilla Square, Square we're trying to do is to try to build their capacity. But uh, I think the, a green approach comes from the top. It takes leadership. It takes commitment. And I think uh, the government will set, the, will set the tone in terms of the direction. I remember we, we tried to push forward, uh, you know, how to tackle this issue of single-use plastic in, in Liberia. And we were sort of looking around. I remember you, you, uh, Uganda, I mean, uh, Rwanda banned them. And uh, by just having that discussion, we realized there are a lot of jobs linked to, uh, 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 you know, sachet water production, you know, because of access to water challenges. There are so many entrepreneurs all across the country, over 30,000 entrepreneurs all across the country that are going to be affected immediately were we, were we to issue a ban on, uh, on sachet water, uh, on single-use plastic, which is one of the big uh, uh, part of sachet water distribution. And so, yeah, we are. We say, well, now access to water, uh, access to safe drinking water has been improved uh, by, you know, having so many, by stimulating that, that industry where you have so many now uh, sachet water producers all across the country, you know, entrepreneurs that are creating jobs all across the country in a country where you have very high unemployment. And then you had the consideration of, okay, well, the environmental impact of plastic, uh, in our waterways, uh, because there's no clear process to, to collect, recycle, um, is also huge. So it's a policy decision that, you know, is very difficult to make. I, I think we, we were able to look at ways to, to create another sort of uh, small industry around uh, collection and, and production into recycled bags or, or selling it back to the plastic companies to, to, to do that. But it has to be an intentional a, a, a policy direction by the government. And when that is done, then of course, investors will take their cues uh, from that, uh, you know, and, and, and follow suit. Same thing with it, like, same thing like education, for example, you know, there's a young guy now that is doing a, a high school in, in Liberia uh, called Loop Academies. And the idea is to use the STEMS uh, model 
to train Liberians for today's reality. Um, it comes with a lot of challenges. So we're working with him to see how best we get him the kind of support he needs. But the government has to have intentional policy that, that is able to support innovators like him and other, other in that sector. It's also looking at the ramifications of these intentional policies. It's no good banning single-use plastics if you then cut off a supply of safe drinking water. Yeah. And um, you've all mentioned the word innovation um, and how that plays a role in this pandemic recovery. But pretty innovative finance solutions is, is something that's banded around a lot. But what actually are they? Hmm. Okay. Um, I'd answer that and then I just want to answer on innovation as well, because I see some of the questions are related to that. So innovative finance, um, in my mind, there can be, you know, one traditional definition is anything that's, um, you know, micro contributions that can uh, like taxes on airline uh, tickets, etc. But I think the big uh, agenda here is, you know, the ODA, the official development is assistance has remained constant uh, during the crisis at $150 billion a year. But that means that's all that money available for development, but that's spread across all the multilateral banks, all the UN agencies, et cetera. So then the question is, there is this 400 trillion in private capital. The other money that exists in the world is that. So I already have a mantra called capital should serve humanity and not the other way around in some ways. So the idea is how do you bring some of that 400 trillion into development? So what's happening is um, it's a, there's a certain degree of innovation required because that capital says, I want listed rated equity you know, instruments because they are um, sophisticated financial players, the pension funds, the insurance companies. And so what happens is if we could create an intermediary uh, organization that is rated. So there has been an example of another company, a bank called Dance Bank. They created a SPV of $177 million into which two pension funds put that money, which was then given to an impact player for responsibility, which then invested in SMEs in the LDCs. And for example, UNCDF could play that role as well. And then the pension, uh, the, uh, the interest from the SMEs goes to pay the coupon of the, uh, the pension funds, bonds. But there has to be one player in the middle, AA. So we, we are calling upon uh, the banks and the financial institutions of the world today to create such kind of uh, um, innovative structures that would allow that money to come uh, and safely in and safely out. So that's uh, kind of the uh, financial, uh, you know, innovation that we need to see in the markets. And that should lead to other kinds of funds. So, you know, the funds that we've created, um, you know, there's blended financing, right? For that's more relevant to the entrepreneurs on the line. It's a $250 million fund where we have partnered with Bamboo Capital and we provide the first loss, the 50 million through our donors who support us. And the, the first loss uh, creates some of that uh, de-risking de and the coverage. And so then the 200 million is private capital that comes in. And all of this invests in SMEs between 2.250K uh, and 2.5 million. This is called the missing middle. It's greater than what the microfinance institutions can do and smaller than what traditional investors do. So that's, um, that's kind of the innovation. That's ways of you know, bringing that, you know, the question is where is the money and then trying to get the money into the development arena. But before we sort of ending, I want to say to the uh, panel some of the questions. So on the entrepreneurs and access to finance, I think this is very key. So here at CDF, we run some innovation challenge funds. Everything we do, we have to always do competitively. So we run challenge funds on women businesses, et cetera. So I'd encourage more of those to be done. We try to do them online. So well, you know, when there is digital access that um, there can be access to these. Um, we are also creating a platform called SDG Co 500, you know, co standing for companies sort of, and here we want to onboard all the companies, you know, people who are listening in the entrepreneurs, so that then there's an ecosystem and access to impact investors, etc. So it's, uh, I know there are platforms out there that we want to make this uh, better and, uh, you know, bigger and better than most and hopefully have the UN behind it so that it might really serve this purpose of getting access to capital for entrepreneurs. Vina, before I turn to you about this idea of innovation, I just want to pick up something that Priti's mentioned with the SMEs and entrepreneurs and another question that we've got, which I will direct to Axel because it's um, a, a young female entrepreneur from Liberia who runs a snack business, Grace Bubba. She asks a really important question. How can there be more accessible 
funds for young entrepreneurs who who don't have those years of experience they don't have the connections you know they they didn't study in the in the top schools in in the US so they they don't know where to go to tap into to all of these things what advice would you give to a, a young entrepreneur who is ready to go but doesn't have the funds well, I often tell the story of uh, a, another young entrepreneur who's, uh, who's a great mentor of many other entrepreneurs in Liberia. He's a good source uh, to talk to, uh, Mahmoud Johnson. Um, again, young man back from school, uh, started uh, what was supposed to be, I think, a, a waste, uh, you know, a palm kernel shell uh, waste uh, to be sold for biofuel in another country realize that you can actually process the kernel shells into palm kernel oil. And, and so he went uh, on knocking on doors. And, and at once, so the first, the first advice is uh, you have to be uh, engaged and, and knock on as many doors as possible uh, because there are, you know, uh, individuals uh, who are maybe willing to hold your hand. So he went knocking on doors. He was able to do a lot of research to see what funding opportunities were out there. He was able to compete in many, many challenges and win a lot of awards through the process. Uh, but most important, why he was successful at doing it, because he had a story to tell. And that story was he was creating it's a young entrepreneur that were creating jobs, but creating jobs for a lot of young people and a lot of young women uh, entrepreneurs who were selling, you know, Women entrepreneurs dominate the whole oil palm production uh, process, and, and they will often throw away the shells uh, after production. They now had a new revenue stream. Uh, so he's worked with uh, women uh, oil palm uh, operators all across Liberia to buy their, their waste and now convert it into now fancy skin creams and, and soaps and, and that sort of thing. So first, be willing to talk to a lot of people um, I know we used to have uh, the Life Fund, the Liberia Innovation Fund for Entrepreneurs, and the idea was that, you know, pre-seed funding, uh, government would be able to provide either a guarantee or microcredit uh, to, um, to uh, entrepreneurs like herself. Another thing I recommend is uh, talk to Access Bank and begin to build a relationship with a bank, uh, because uh, through that process, you learn about some of the programs and the banks may be able to tie to bring you in in some of, some of those programs that are available to support entrepreneurs. And, you know, I think the Mahmood model, make a lot of friends and let people know what you're doing. Uh, you'll be surprised that people may not be able to support you financially, but they may be able to share information with you, maybe to point you in the right direction, or uh, even give you your first contract in terms of uh, 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 supplying uh, them. We used to have the Made in Liberia uh, trade fair I understand now that it's being done uh, by, I think, by the Chamber of Commerce. Every weekend, uh, I think once a month, they have a trade fair where you know entrepreneurs can exchange ideas and, and showcase their products. So that's another uh, medium you have. You know, entrepreneurs are stubborn people. You you know, uh, I tell people that there are entrepreneurs that are trained and there are entrepreneurs that are born. Entrepreneurs that are born, uh, you know, never take no for an answer. They are very stubborn people. They get a thousand no's and they continue. And they're very passionate and committed to their product. I often tell the story of, of one entrepreneur who has, a, has amazing products of spices uh, that she now exports to New York. And every time we try to get her, you know, to have an investor come in, you know, take her to scale. She's like, no, 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 no. I don't want anybody, <laughs> you know, I like control of my, of my business. Is my retirement. I'm passionate about it, and I, I don't want to have to report to anybody. I like the way I'm doing it. So for me, sitting down with her, she could tell you everything about her product, from the raw materials to, you know, who's her backup when she wants out of supply. So she owns it, and, and she goes around and she promotes it. When you say hello, she tells you her product in like five minutes. You will know everything you need to know about her product. So you have to become that entrepreneur that one is so bad that no is never an answer. No is never an answer. We're almost at the end of this session now. So I do want to ask a, a quick question to each of you. And it's a really tricky one. Um, so I apologize now. But I wonder whether we can finish with each of you saying in your experience and, and your personal opinion, the single most important thing that must be considered 
right now in this post-pandemic recovery for emerging countries, for an inclusive recovery, for a green recovery. Um, I know nothing can really be boiled down into a single thought or soundbite, but mm -hmm. if you could try, um, Vina, for you then, the single most important thing that, sorry to put you on the spot and to put you first, uh, the single most important thing in your opinion, well, I think I'll go back to uh, something that um, our uh, keynote speaker said, uh, that we all have a role to play. We, everyone, whatever you do, however small it might seem, ha can have an impact. You know, if it's that little drop of water, uh, if it's uh, picking up, you know, just educating yourself as to what's going on, if it, it you know, by a wonderful journalist like yourself, uh, if it is, uh, you know, turning off the light, if it is uh, helping someone that you see uh, needs a hand, and some of it could be mental help too. You know, we've all, you know, that's something that we haven't really touched upon in this discussion, uh, but the mental effects of COVID, uh, including things like increased domestic violence. Uh, so I, I think things that, that I guess that's what I would say is the takeaway is that everyone has a role to play and especially the amazing innovators uh, and impact investors that are listening in uh, today. Thank you. It's recognizing that we all can actually play our bit. Axel, over to you. Yeah, I think uh, as uh, uh, Vina said, I will go back to our opening speaker uh, and the keynote speaker. And, and sum it up in terms of the fact that, look, what COVID has, has brought to the fore is that we're all a part of a global village and all lives do matter, no matter, regardless of the geographic location. And, and so while trade opening up has created some of the wealthiest people in the world with more money to spend for several generations, it's also uh, creating poverty beyond uh, what we had people have foreseen or projected and COVID now has exacerbated that even more. And so we have to think about a life is a life is a life, no matter the location and, uh, and make it our concerted effort that what we do does translate into impacting lives, no matter their location. Every life matters. To you then, Pretty. So a simply capital should serve humanity, capital markets for development. That's what I want to see. I want to see in post COVID, we have some rhino bonds in the markets. We should have elephant bonds. We should have, uh, you know, Liberian housing, whatever structures and all to serve humanity to get them to that basic standard of living. So that sankalp, the sankalp, the resolve to get that. And the hope uh, for one world, one humanity, one planet. And for the, my namesake, that little girl, Preeti, to see her at the United Nations one day would be great. So capital serving humanity, not the other way around. Preeti Sinha, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Capital Development Fund. Thank you so much. Axel Adi, former Liberia Commerce Minister and now founder of EcoCap Investment Group. Thank you for joining us. And Veena Reddy, Mission Director for USAID in India. Thank you so much, guys. And I know we've run over, but there's so much to talk about. Um, Thank you hugely. And to everyone who has been listening, I will now hand the microphone over to Ariel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Axel, Preeti, Veena. Uh, you have, uh, this has been an inspirational conversation and thank you so much. You've given hope that, that we can, and I think already in fact have begun mainstreaming impact. Uh, we know these are multifaceted issues. There's policy, investment, capacity building. Um, and it's really encouraging to hear your stories of, of what's already being done in addition to, I think, what each of us is doing individually to mainstream impact. So thank you, thank, thank you each of you once again. Um, so I think with, with that, we'll sort of wrap this segment up. Uh, remember, please do log into our networking platform, Brella, to connect uh, with these incredible speakers and other attendees at SunCup. If you're having any trouble gaining access to the event platform, please drop me a note. Uh, I'm sure you've all been receiving a lot of emails from me lately already, so you probably have my email address. Um, we are not yet done for today. 
Don't miss yet another Nobel laureate, Professor Mohammed Yunus, who will be the gig who will be giving a keynote address immediately following uh, this. Also in about an hour, we will have our first entrepreneur slumber party um, at Sankalp with the Cartier Women's Initiative. And you don't want to miss these six fabulous women entrepreneurs who are changing the world sustainably and profitably. I'll now welcome Wendy, uh, the country head for India at IFC to share a message and to close this segment. Welcome, Wendy. Welcome to Sankalp. My name is Wendy Warner, India Country Head at IFC, based in New Delhi. At IFC, we leverage the private sector in emerging markets to create opportunities and inclusive economic growth. We're very excited to be at Sankalp and we are committed to mainstreaming impact and building an ecosystem for sustainable and equitable economic recovery. We hope to engage with innovators and change makers at Sankalp and transform people's lives across the global south. I hope you have a great Sankalp and meet inspiring and like-minded people. Great, thank you so much everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your evening, day, wherever you are. <laughs>